Hey everybody and welcome back. So this is a continuation of the video series I'm doing on the B36 project that I did a long time ago. Um, in the description of this video you'll see links to the other parts and um, to make a very long story short got the plane 99.9% .9 done and sold it and to fund my hobby because I'd run out of money. But in this video, we are going to talk about the landing gear. So if you don't know about my B36, I had decided to build an electric B36 with a 257 inch wingspan. And I ended up collecting about 3,200 pictures of the build, which lasted many years. I mean, from the moment that I started the build to the moment I sold it, I think elapsed uh, almost five years. So, um, when we think about this video series, I started out with the uh, basically an overview. I did a design video, the fuselage video, the Bombay video, uh, the wing, uh, which was a video, the ailerons and flaps, which was a video, and now we're going to do the main landing gear. And the main landing gear was extremely problematic and caused uh, massive disruption in the build. Uh, I don't know how to articulate the frustration I had and keep it clean. Um, essentially, I I had started a wing 1.0. I call it wing 1.0. It was my original wing. And then as it was about, I don't know, 50% through the construction, I found out the landing gear that I was promised could be made wouldn't fit my wing. So, uh, and I'll get into that in a little bit. And I'm going to try to be as... Uh, pleasant as I can. I hate putting people down and I hate being negative, but it's part of the build. Before, let's go to a bigger screen here. So, um, before I get too far with this, I want to talk about my sponsor, RTL Fasteners. If you need bolts, nuts, servo screws, bl uh, blind nuts, any kind of the bolts and nuts we used in our hobby, I strongly re recommend that you go to rtlfasteners.com. There, if you use the code DA30, you'll get 30% off orders over $50. Fabulous company. I really recommend you get, check them out. So, when we talk about the landing gear on this airplane, and I'm going to focus mainly on the main landing gear in this video, and hopefully you'll understand by the time we're done with this, just how much of a cluster this was and um, sometimes you can run into a hiccup on a project that you're you're building yourself and the frustration is so high that you just decide you want to just shelf it for a while and sometimes you just give up because you worked yourself into a corner and you just realize either the expense or the time or mechanically it's not right but when you're designing your own aircraft from scratch, and I'm not talking about building from plans, because normally when you build from plans, somebody else has already figured everything out. But when you're designing 100% from scratch, you do run the risk sometimes of running into um, challenges that uh, just seem too big to overcome. And on this landing gear, it about whipped my ass. I mean, it, this, this was... Um, a really bad uh, part of the entire project. So originally I had designed um, in my 3D software at the time, which was 3DS Max. This is before I had Fusion 360. I had designed uh, kind of a mock-up conceptual what I wanted the landing gear to look. And I wanted it to be scale compared to the real landing gear. So I started investigating some different air, air cylinders and I thought about different electric approaches. Uh, with jack screws. I, I thought of a lot of different things. So what I started out with originally was cutting up some steel and polishing it up and figuring out how to build some of the uh, landing gear parts for the aircraft. And you'll see in a minute what all of this ended up becoming. But basically, I was trying to build this as scale as I could to the real landing gears on a B-36. So I ended up with this mock-up, and this is actually a different mock-up than the pictures you were seeing before. There were nine different iterations of mock-ups. Okay, I just want you to understand how many, and, and this is before I even started talking to a landing gear company. Because at this point, I was really thinking, I'm going to build my own landing gear. 
And I wish I, wish I would have stayed that course. I wish I would have had the self-confidence that I would have stayed the course and just made my own landing gear. So I ended up with this just as a mock-up. This was never intended to be a real landing gear, okay? So you, you notice I had some aluminum there, a little bit of steel in the middle, had a carbon fiber shaft. I was kind of on the right path to what I ultimately should have done. And I just, I mean, I spent a good probably month to six weeks just going through different mock-up iterations. You know, I made this contraption right here, which was going to have a couple of air cylinders and actually a couple of servos. The servos were going to help lock things down or lock things up, and the air cylinders were going to do the oomph of the uh, moving of the, the main landing gear. And in some ways, I wish I would have stuck with this, but my self-confidence at the time just... Uh, I was a wimp. I, I just did not think I was able to do this. And one of the problems was, is when I talked to this landing gear manufacturer, they're like, oh, no problem. We can build this. We can do it with our eyes closed. Well, that was far from the truth. They couldn't do it with their eye closed, eyes closed. So, you know, this is just a view from the bottom of one of the iterations I was looking at. I was just... Um, one of the things, I guess one of the things I want to stress that's hard about this is when you build all these different mock-ups, one thing I've learned, and I didn't learn at the moment that I was doing this, is take a mock-up from the very beginning of the concept and finish the mock-up and then test how the mock-up would go. Sometimes when you're halfway through the mock-up, you're like, ah, oh, this isn't going to work, and you stop. Well, it might have just been because you were getting frustrated. Finish the mock-up before you go to another mock-up because the chances are that last 10% of that mock-up, everything might come together and you're realizing, hey, this is kind of cool, okay? Um, I like to cut a lot of uh, pieces and parts out of different materials that have different strengths for mock-ups instead of cutting aluminum or cutting wood. And sometimes this phenolic stuff was just really nice because you can machine it, you can drill it, and uh, it's, it's pretty strong. Now, it's not strong enough for flight hardware, but it's plenty strong enough to, to do proof of concept or uh, mock-up stuff. And I did go through an entire testing of what the forces was with different size cylinders. And you would be m just blown away at the exponential strength that comes out of different size cylinders at 100 PSI. Uh, it was staggering. And one day I may just do a video just on showing you all what the different um, stroke uh, forces are using different uh, cylinders that had different cubic volumes or the different piston size. And it, it was just, it was amazing. Um, here's where uh, I actually thought I was a little bit getting on target and I machined all of this and this was a complete pile of crap. This didn't work. But one of them that actually was really, really promising was this where I had the cylinders doing a push me, pull me. That's what I call it. And this is what I should have stuck with. And this is what I should have followed through with and made my own landing gear. And I think I would have been super excited, but I didn't. I just didn't have the self-confidence to do it. Uh, here's another picture of it. And it was awesome. So now we're going to jump from all of this to the landing gear that got delivered to me. And uh, I, I hate to put people down, but there are people out there that will say, sure, I can do that with my eyes closed, or sure, I can do this. And then when they get tasked to do it, didn't pay attention to my drawings. They didn't pay, pay attention to my emails I sent them. I had sent a plethora of information to this person. And look, just so you know, this company uh, doesn't exist like it did 12 years ago. Uh, the person that did this isn't there anymore. And so here's the laney year. My daughter's holding the nose gear, which does not make much sense right now, but I'll show it to you in a minute. And I do not spend hardly any time on the nose gear in this video because it was just a cluster. It just was, it wasn't scale. It was just a bad idea, but I'm just going to move on now. But behind her sitting on the uh, table next to the uh, soda can was the main landing gear. 
And that thing was the heaviest pig of stainless steel and steel that I have ever seen. This could have actually probably been mounted on a uh, experimental aircraft a person flew in. It was so strong, overbuilt, and just way, way too, uh, it just weighed way too much. Um, if you look at a lot of this stuff here, it was just all steel. And there were a few aluminum pieces, but for the most part, it was just all steel and some brass. And it greatly frustrated me because originally when the landing gear um, was quoted to me, it looked nothing like this, had none of these parts, had none of the air cylinders, had none of the actuating devices, and I had designed my first wing around a landing gear that wasn't even going to fit, I found out. Once they started sending me pictures of what they were going to build, it wouldn't even fit my wing. And I said, look, this isn't going to work. So when they finally landed on what they could build me, I had to design a second wing. Here's the nose gear, and this is the orientation it's mounted. So basically in, in that left hand is the main landing gear that could go on virtually any airplane, and it was going to suck up the nose gear. And that way the nose gear could have steering. Um, if you've seen some of my own landing gear designs, you know mine is 100% um, cleaner in design and and uh, more efficient in design. Now I will tell you one thing that was super sexy cool. I got all my wheels made for me by Glennis. And what I hear now, Glennis has pretty much stopped doing things for the hobby. I Maybe they're back now, but I know for a couple of years they just weren't answering the phone. But the, the most scale landing gear I've ever, I mean, I'm sorry, the most scale wheels I've ever seen in my life came from Glennis Aircraft. And these wheels were absolutely the coolest part of the landing gear. So now I decided to go on a little um, exploration and figure out how to build landing gear struts that were going to be a lot lighter than that stainless steel. So I looked to carbon fiber. And this is another thing that really stressed me out about this individual. Because I told him I wasn't happy with the stainless steel and I was going to go to carbon fiber. And the response was, well, I don't know anything about carbon fiber. I, I you know, I, I, I don't, basically just stuck his head in the sand, almost in a pissy way with me that I wasn't gonna use a stainless steel um, kryptonite or whatever you wanna call this stainless steel weight that was going in the airplane. It was crazy how heavy it was. And in the back, you can see my wing 1.0. And that was right before I decided to trash the whole wing because it wasn't, nothing was going to fit. So I decided to take carbon fiber, and that's a carbon fiber shaft there on the bottom or tube. And you can see I put a little bit of clear tape on it. Uh, I'm sorry, I put that aluminum tape on it to make it look a little bit more scale like the real uh, B36. It had different segments in the casting. In the upper left-hand corner, you can see I took those pieces and started making them look more scale. And you'll see as I proceed here how I turned this into a scale-looking landing gear, and I took over 60% of the weight out of the landing gear. So here I am just putting some balsa wood on and a little bit of filler. So I ended up with all the parts looking like this, and when they were painted, they look like this. And then as I started to assemble the landing gear, I started getting everything to look a lot more cleaner, a lot lighter, and I mean a lot lighter. Um, some of the suspension pieces, I actually drilled out the inside of the aluminum and took probably as much as 80% of the material out of the aluminum because it was just not needed for a, a, a landing gear this size. It was ridiculous. Um, this is the air tubing that I was doing for the brakes, which all got painted up when it was done. Here's an example of the finished landing gear with carbon fiber pipes, uh, I mean tubes, the aluminum drilled out, all kinds of weight was taken, literally 60% of the weight was taken out of these landing gears by the time I was done with them. And that includes the actuators too. So I thought that looked pretty sexy when I was done for the B36. And uh, I was happy. I, I mean, at this point I was happy. Now keep in mind, I wasn't happy with having to build another wing I wasn't happy with the fact that, you know, I had to go through all this work. 
I mean, it almost made me walk away from the project, but I didn't give up. I kept going full steam ahead. This is what the landing gear looked like with me putting it into the wing now, wing 2.0. And this is, so look, I don't know how to completely describe the actuator. I don't know to say if it was a cluster or if it was kind of brilliant, but it was not a very efficient design. So it's hard to see in these pictures, but it's basically the air, air cylinders needed to be on the outside of where the landing gear would fold into the wing. So what the gentleman do, did, he figured out it was going to take two air cylinders to move this landing gear, and then it was going to need to get around the pivot point and run the linkage that would fold it on the other side. And when I first looked at this, I was like, wow, there's so many other ways this could have been done than doing it this way. And this is where you sometimes, when you promise you can build something and then you in my opinion, you, you scurry real quick to try to come up with the design. And then when you get the design, you realize that uh, there were a lot better ways to do this. And I'm not going to show all the better ways to do it because I'm not here to put anybody down. I'm here to hopefully share with you the enormous cluster I, I had with this landing gear. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I don't even, I, I, that's all I want to say. I, I'm not here to put anybody down, okay? I'm just trying to warn you all. If you're going to go to somebody to build a landing gear, I would send them your drawings and say, please sign this and send it back to me so that I know that you read my drawings, that you understand what I'm doing here. Because the, the, the period of time was almost a year between when I first said, I'm building a B-36, here's my drawings, can you build a landing gear? And I'm saying, yes. To me giving them the order and then them telling me that the landing gear that they had quoted me won't work. So now we're going to talk about the landing gear doors. And this was another um, interesting part of the build, to say the least, that I did go through some different iterations. So originally I was going to carve out some wood and figure out how to make wooden landing gears. And that was a dumb idea because these were going to be heavy. They weren't going to really conform to the, the, the uh, wing correctly. They were going to be hard to put actuation and hinges on. And uh, as soon as I was done with these little doors here, I just threw them away because they just weren't going to work. Plan B is I took some styrofoam and started sanding it and getting it to the right shape. And then I spackled the heck out of it. I glassed it, primed and sanded, primed and sanded. I ended up with this, ended up with this, mounted it to a board, painted it and uh, clear coated it and polished the crap out of it. Then I used some of that RTV liquid rubber to pour over it to make a mold, pop the inside out and now I could lay fiberglass inside it. This is a prototype and make me a pretty cool little fiberglass um, landing your door. Now, just so you know, the reason these, there's little folds in this fiberglass right here, uh, going through here, was for strength. I was just experimenting. I was just playing around. I didn't do that in the, the finished model. The finished version looked like this. A little bit of carbon fiber in there, the actuation device, or the mounting for the actuation device. Built a couple of the doors for left and right, of course. Then I had started experimenting with how I was going to close that door. And originally I was going to do it with the servo. And I found out really quickly it was going to need a really big ass servo to be able to close that. So I ditched that idea and put an air cylinder inside the wing. And this is slicker than snot. This works so perfect with the air cylinder. Now keep in mind I had to have a sequencer in there to be able to open the door, lower the landing gear, uh, close the door, all that junk because I've got many air systems that had to work uh, right or they would run into each other, okay? So um, that's the door closed. 
That's the door open where I was testing it with the uh, temporary air system and it worked just slicker than snot. Got the landing gear in there to make sure that everything would clear each other. Uh, you know, the actuator had to be in between the two wheels when the wheels were up. This is the landing gear door closed. This was some of the actuator parts that went into the wing. That's the actuator that opened and closed the door. There's a little bit better picture of it when I started to actually get the air hoses a little bit more. Um, and this is from the aft trailing edge of the wing. But this is where I started to get the, um, the air lines uh, kind of more installed with the way they were going to be permanently in the wing. Here's a view of both the doors open and I had the Bombay doors open. Because keep in mind, you got to make sure everything clears. If it's sitting on the ground, and for static display, I've got the landing gear doors open because of maintenance or something, let's say. And I've got the Bombay doors open. I don't want them running into each other. Um, I always make all of my landing gear doors able to open and close. So if I've got to do maintenance inside the, the landing gear bay or something, I can just open them. And, um, you know, just, just be able to get around things. This is a little bit of a different picture of the actuator. Uh, different angle shows how the door is closed and how cool that gap is between the front fiberglass piece and the actual door this is what it looked like painted oh no i'm sorry this was my mock-up um before i cut it up just painted it put it up on there see what it looked like this is another one of my mock-up this is a picture down inside the from the top the top skin's not on the wing yet showing the door pulled up shut. There was a little bit of a gap between the hinge line of the door and the fuse, which I, I wasn't sure if I was going to close it or not because nobody could see it from the angle it was at. Here's a picture of the nacelle. But keep in mind, the landing gear opened into the nacelle. Okay? And this is a... This is a part of the build that I wasn't really prepared for because I was originally just going to leave that open. But then I started thinking, how bad is that going to look in a flyover if I look up and can see those holes in the nacelles where the landing gear's got to do? So I, I decided I've got to make those doors. So if you look right here, I have cut into that nacelle. I've got some tape working as a temporary hinge. Okay. And that's how much was going to have to open up into the nacelle for the landing gear strut to fit into the nacelle. Okay? So, originally, I was just going to leave holes open there, and I thought, that's going to look like crap. This is another angle of that having to open up. So, what I did was um, I put hinges on. I mean, and this shows all of the doors in place. Most people don't realize there's actually a door that flaps back onto the wing on the B36 that gets out of the way of the strut. Um, so I, I decided to glass one half of the nacelle because I wanted to have some strength in that skin as I cut it apart to make the doors out of it. And this was it all glassed up. And here is me just laying the pieces. But see, there's a part of the door that flaps back onto the wing. There's a part of the door that opens into the nacelle. And then there's a part of the door that fits on the strut and moves with the landing gear. And right here was just me mocking it up. This is what it was going to look like when the gear was down. Just like this. The door, the main door is closed. That flat door is flat back. Now, I don't, can't find any proof that that, what I call the flat door, closed once it was open. I think once it was folded back on the wing, it stayed open. And most of the pictures I've got, which were hundreds of their full-scale landing gear doors, showed that kind of flapped back. So this is a different angle of the mock-up. Just showing how the clearances were going to have to work. This is showing the mock-up I was making of having, how that door is going to flap back on itself. Which I got all of this done. I mean, this was all actuated and working. This shows the inner, or what I call the nacelle door with, with two small hinges. You can see the hinges there. But keep in mind, this had to fold in two different sections. So I want to show you this again. This is the door uh, completely in the closed position. It had a fold, and then it pivoted at the hinges all the way back. 
Okay, so here's the flap door going back, and you can see I put a little servo in there that was going to flap the door back. And this is looking at the inside of the nacelle door. Now, right now, this is just a mock-up, but that servo there was going to pull that back, and rubber bands were going to help fold everything. So as you see, that first part folds back a little bit, and the rubber band's helping pull the door up. And then as the servo comes back, it pulls the rest of the door back. Now there's going to be springs in here, and this was all going to be, um, you know, covered with like uh, epoxy resin to be strong. But from the inside, that's what that looked like. This is a picture with the uh, what I call the flap door flap back. And I did have a mock-up of just a strut and a tennis ball I put on this when I would just experiment and actuate. Now I knew I had to get the rest of the cell done because I was going to have a lot of hatches because you've got to be able to get the things to service inside the wing. Okay, if you can't get inside and service things, you're going to lose your mind. And I've built airplanes where you can't get to servos, and if the servo breaks, you are going to have to cut in to get to it because, knock on wood, out of all the years I've been doing this, I've only had two servos fail. I'm sure I'll have one fail next weekend now. But seriously... Um, I've owned over uh, 175 servos. I mean, right now, I own 90 servos uh, for all the airplanes I have. And I've only had two servos actually take a dump on me. Now, that doesn't include where I've, I've accidentally screwed up the cables or screwed up the plug and stuff like that. I'm talking about mechanically the servo failing. This was me you know, building the hatches. This showed both landing gears down with the doors open. And then I started to experiment with flipping the airplane over and actuating everything to make sure everything worked. Because keep in mind when it's on the back, your landing gear uh, actual actuators are not seeing any load on them because the wheels are folding down, gravity's pulling them into the airplane. You may have heard some of the old stories back in the day where a fighter plane would roll on its back and they would pull the landing gear in because the hydraulic systems were weak or something. And I've read about that, but on this plane, I'm not going to roll it inverted to retract the gears. This is just a picture from the bottom looking up into the actuator. This was showing that I had the hatch off for that inner door. So this needed to be a hatch that I could take on and off. This was actually showing below the hatch open and how I could take the landing gear in and out if I needed to actuate the landing gear. On all those bombs, by the way, that you're seeing in the fuselage there, those were air cylinders for the landing gears. So I needed to hide the air cylinders in the airplane and the rear bomb bay had permanent bombs mounted that were going to be the air cylinders. The front bomb bay was where I would actually be able to drop fake ordnance from. Here's another picture. This shows how the wheel does come up out of the top of the wing. Real B-36s had blisters on the top of the wings. This was me getting this uh, flap servos installed and the landing gear and everything in there to make sure nothing was running into each other. Everything was actuating and everything was working just perfect. And then I put her on her feet and let her sit on her landing gear. And I rolled this plane around a lot in this configuration, believe it or not. And you can see my son in the background with the radio in his hand. Because I was actually, when we were doing this, we were playing around with the bomb bays too. We were actuating bomb bays and stuff, the front one. Uh, this was me playing around a little bit more uh, with the system. And we actually, believe it or not, put just the landing gear when it was in the unmodified uh, iteration before. I'd taken all the stainless steel and everything out. I had my daughter sit on this. I had like five kids sit on this. This was so overbuilt and strong. It was insane, but we had a lot of fun on the street. I also wanted to see how the brakes worked, how everything worked, and, and this was us just having fun. And then I did my load testing and drop testing. And as you can see, there's a bunch of weights on there, uh, barbells and a big piece of I-beam. And I had, I think, a 48-inch moment arm there, and I would drop that from 14 inches. And I did a lot of testing of my carbon fiber design where I had replaced everything that came with stainless steel. And I was, I was super excited. Um, but, um, yeah, that's pretty much it on this. The next video we're going to get to look at is the nacelles. 
and there was an amazing amount of testing I had to do on the nacelles and mock-ups and the cowlings and air cooling and everything for this aircraft and that will be the next video on the B-36. So that's it everybody. I mean I hope you understand that um, sometimes I wonder if I like to self-mutilate my mind because I take on these big projects. And so you know, though, I mean, only the B-36 and C-130s were the ones that I never flew. Both of them got sold. I would have flown the B-36 and I would have flown the C-130. But all my other big projects flew and actually fly really good. And they're planes that I still enjoy today. The MSL-2, the yellow and blue plane in the frame right here. I've got a hundred and I think 65 flights on it now and I'm having an absolute blast with it. And uh, yeah, so all I would say is if your passion really wants you to take on projects like this, there is a chance you're gonna hit burnout. There's a chance you're gonna hit a brick wall and just say, I don't know how to finish this. I don't know how to make this so it's gonna be a safe airplane in the air. And that's one of the things about me. My, I don't know if it's OCD or what, but I'm not going to ever just fly a plane to fly a plane. It's got to be mechanically sound. I got to know that the wing loading and Q wing loading is right. I've got to know that everything on the aircraft is right before I'm going to send it into the air. And if it's not, the planes could be a hangar queen. It could be a plane that I never fly. Never happened yet. I've sold them and I don't call that not flying them. But if you watch this far into the video, that means you're probably what I call one of my super fans that absolutely love what I'm doing. And all I'm trying to do is get you to understand that let your creative juices flow. I don't care if it's a little foamy, if it's a cardboard plane, I don't care what you're building. But there may be a time that you run into that brick wall. And what I normally do is walk away from the project for like a month. You have no idea how much it helps you when you walk away from a project for a month. I have a plane called the Fra Emma Stein and it's a big transport plane and it's gonna be the next video I do. But it's a plane that I, I it's got an eight foot long cargo bay. It's got a pusher puller uh, twin, uh, well, it's got two nacelles, two engines pulling, two engines, uh, tractors and pushers. And I just finished the redesign of the outboard wings. And I'm going to start that in July next this year. So yes, I'm going to have two projects going again. My Ultralight and the Fraun Mistine. But I have to get the Fraun Mistine done for Ceph next year. I've promised too many people that transport plane with, I think, a 225-inch wing is going to be flying. And um, But I, I took a year and a half off from that airplane. Um, because the wings came out too heavy crappy design on my part learned a lot but the new redesign of the outer wings and my flying uh, my tail uh, tail feathers i think is brilliant so the airplane's actually going to be flying by march or april of 23 now but that airplane i got so close to getting it right but then when i really started weighing it and i started really doing some calculations on it i'm like this is going to be a pig and I want it to carry at least 50 pounds of cargo. I want to drop bowling balls out of it with big, big eight foot canopies and do some really neat things with this airplane. So, but the next B-36 video is going to be on the nacelles. There is a C-130 series video coming up, the Fra Emmestein video coming up, and an update on my Airbike coming up. Okay? So look, I know you've watched through this with me for 35 minutes now. And if you're still hanging around, thanks. And please like and support and subscribe and all of that stuff to my YouTube channel because I'm trying to build it. And it is growing pretty well. Uh, you got to be honest. I'm really, really excited with how it's turning out. So thanks, everybody. Please take a kid flying. Get kids involved with model aviation. There are so many old timers out there. And look, I'm 59. I know some people could look at me as an old timer. But I fly some crazy stuff. I design some crazy stuff. So mentally, I'm still an 18-year-old, okay? But there are old-timers out there that absolutely destroy this hobby for younger people. And you should just go play golf and destroy other people's golf games. Maybe you just want to move to the villages in Florida and sit back and...
play pinochle or something uh, or do some of those crazy things you all do down there but quit messing with younger people getting into the hobby because you're running them away from the AMA and you're running them away from the uh, model aviation okay we need the youth to be in this hobby okay rock on everybody have a great day be safe and I'll see you next time bye